Design G Ensemble. Combat Edge incorporated a new helmet with an oxygen pressure breathing mask, ensemble, and vest that provided counter pressure to the chest. Its fielding in the 1990s provided Air Force fighter pilots with enhanced anti G and G lock protection. In the acceleration program, what was done here uh, to a large measure is the basis for what fighter pilots are using today to fly high performance aircraft. But I do know that we have saved pilot lives and we have increased the value of those fighter planes. Because if you build a plane to 9G and all you can do is fly it at 7G, you wasted a lot of money. While enhanced anti-G equipment and training gave fighter pilots relief from the fatiguing effects of acceleration and air-to-air -air combat maneuvers, aircrew fatigue on long duration missions remained an operational problem. Uh, in the area of fatigue countermeasures with uh, the Iraqi war and the Afghanistan situation, we've done a lot of work with the B-1 and B-2 bomber crews who had, at that point, had to fly some very long what we call global power missions, meaning that they departed and returned to their home base without stopping. Brooks scientific studies to find ways to counter the physiological effects of air crew fatigue led to the base becoming an Air Force Center for Air and Ground Crew Fatigue Research. Brooks scientists collaborated with the Army and Navy to develop fatigue countermeasures that enhanced warfighters' operational capabilities. Uh, the aircraft were not designed with a crew rest facility. They were not even designed such that you could augment the crew and put a third pilot on. So fatigue management for a mission of that duration for two guys uh, became a real issue in terms of keeping them safe and able to complete the mission. A mission like that might have six air refuelings. So we developed scheduling techniques, uh, computer techniques to predict where fatigue will occur so they would know to expect it. Air Force fatigue researchers broke new ground in developing more effective protocols to improve aircrew alertness that impacted decision making. However, their colleagues at Brooks Air Force Base's Human Resources Laboratory had pioneered cognition research that was vital to human performance. Founded in 1968, the Human Resources Lab built a reputation for innovative education training technology. The lab's human resources technology initiatives were important to the Air Force because the largest single budget item within the Department of Defense, historically, is the cost of personnel training. The Brooks Lab was initially tasked with developing intelligent tutoring systems to train Air Force personnel in aircraft maintenance troubleshooting, mission planning, and radar systems. However, the Brooks Lab's groundbreaking work in the pre-internet era contributed to advances in both military and civilian education. Brooks computer engineers conducted a long-term research project to bring state-of-the-art intelligent tutoring technology to bear on our nation's growing literacy skills problems in mathematics, writing, and science. What could we do for the education system in the country by applying the technology that we had developed? And the question was, can you identify certain things that almost all students need to learn in middle school, essentially? And, and so we took on the obvious things. It was math, science, and writing. So. Those were the three kind of tutors that we built. We refer to that whole program as a fundamental skills tutor program. The primary goal of the fundamental skills training program was to research, develop, and transfer prototype intelligent tutoring systems to public schools and subsequently to private industry. Public schools throughout the country field tested the Brooks tutors. The test validated for the Air Force that computer-based tutors could enhance educational performance. The development of these tutors subsequently augmented academia's educational strategies for improving student performance. While student performance generations earlier was measured, in part by how quickly they could duck and cover during Cold War era atomic bomb drills in schools across the country, knowledge about radiation's bioeffects was in its infancy. However, Air Force scientists in San Antonio, Texas, worked to give humanity possible ways to mitigate ionizing radiation effects from a nuclear blast. The Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine's Radiation Sciences Division was involved initially in finding solutions to protect or minimize the effects of nuclear radiation on air crews. One of the first tasks that we were sort of handed um, 
was to uh, address the issues associated with aircraft and shielding. There was a new aircraft uh, on the design board and the question was what type of shielding can or should we put into this aircraft to shield it from nuclear radiation. This research evolved into ongoing investigations that have explored bioeffects from electromagnetic radiation that has posed a health and safety threat for decades. In 1968, Brooks scientists began a series of biological studies that assessed the effects of high-frequency band electromagnetic radiation. Their work focused on the reality of the world and universe that we live in. The Earth is saturated with many sources that emit electromagnetic radiation. X-rays, ultraviolet and visible light, radiant heat, microwaves and radar, television and radio signals, and electromagnetic fields. These latter forces are produced when electricity moves through power lines, appliances, or anything electrical. Each type of radiation has its own distinctive wave. These waves are identified by their frequency, or how many times in one second they go through one cycle of up and down movement called oscillation. The highest frequency radiation, traveling in waves that oscillate at the fastest rate per second, are gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet light. These waves are called ionizing radiation because they can ionize or break down chemical bonds. Ionizing radiation can cause mutations in living organisms leading to cancers and birth defects. The potential for other forms of electromagnetic radiation, such as microwaves and FM radio signals, to cause harm to humans underscored the Air Force's commitment to seeking ways to mitigate their bioeffects. The Air Force was motivated to do this based on the service being one of the biggest developers and users of radio frequency emitting devices in the world. Consequently, the Air Force has been at the forefront of research on the biological effects of radio frequency radiation for more than 30 years. The issue or the challenge there was to um, protect uh, airmen and, and, and others from uh, uh, hazardous, potentially hazardous exposure to radio frequency radiation. Now, the Air Force uh, at a different directorate develops um, a lot of radio frequency radiation devices. They develop them for communications and for radar and for anti electronic weaponry as well as non lethal weapons. And um, airmen, other scientists are, are exposed, other uh, people who repair the machines are exposed or could be exposed during the development, during the test and evaluation, and during the uh, uh, operational use, of course, and then uh, during maintenance. And sometimes there have been accidents where people have been overexposed, but these are, are producing novel emissions that have never been studied for their health effects before. And so we are assessing the health effects, and then uh, we help set exposure standards so that we know what people need to avoid in order to remain safe. In 1971, Brooks radiation physicist John Mitchell conducted a series of studies to establish the relative effects between heart pacemakers and electromagnetic interference. At the time, pacemakers had a relatively low interference threshold. The Air Force gave test data to cardiac pacemaker manufacturers and the Food and Drug Administration. As a result, pacemaker manufacturers recognized the potential for interference and corrected the problem. This led to devices used today that have very good electromagnetic capabilities. Modern pacemakers now can protect cardiac pacemaker patients from electromagnetic radiation interference, from such things as law enforcement radar guns to microwave ovens. Electromagnetic radiation emissions from military systems have been the primary focus of Air Force research. However, these systems are only part of a larger public health and safety problem. Since the advent of radar during World War II, People have been exposed to microwave radiation. Microwaves are short wavelength, high frequency pulses of electromagnetic energy traveling at the speed of light. After World War II, microwaves and radio frequency radiation emitters have proliferated in response to the public and military's need for them. Advances in technology have produced a profusion of electromagnetic radiation and microwave emitters. They include automatic garage door openers, burglar alarms, microwave ovens, TV and FM radio transmitters, computer screens, and cell phones. In 1957, a dose of 10 milliwatts per square centimeter was adopted by the Defense Department, Bell Laboratories, and the General Electric Corporation 
as a safe exposure level. Such a dose is produced when a square centimeter of the body surface is exposed to one hundredth of a watt of microwave energy. This standard existed for years. However, the Air Force's development of a series of high-powered radar systems during the 1960s led to public concerns about radiation safety levels. The Air Force responded to public concern over PAVEPAWS, a phased array radar warning system that was fielded in 1978. And we didn't know a lot about the effects of radiation on, on the human or on the animals uh, that, were, that were out there at some of those remote radar sites. So the folks at Brooks have been doing that kind of research for years, and they actually work with World Health Organization and set national and world standards, uh, international standards for radiation exposure. PAVEPAWS was designed for early warning detection of sea-launched ballistic missiles targeted against the continental U.S. The public in communities where PAVEPAWS was to be installed opposed it because they believed the system could expose people and wildlife to harmful electromagnetic and microwave radiation. Every kind of problem in this area that came into the Surgeon General's office came immediately down to radiation sciences. So that was about the time when uh, Electronic Systems Division was uh, beginning to develop the over-the-horizon backscatter radar and the pave pulse radar. So uh, the concerns out of that became the people in the areas where they were building it, primarily the uh, pave pulse system that was being built at Otis on Cape Cod. The people began to worry about the um, hazards, the radiation hazards from this big system. So again, we, we were pressed into service to uh, investigate the radiation levels from the pave pause, and it was a very unique system. Uh, it was actually designed to detect uh, sea launch ballistic missiles out to a range of like 3,000 nautical miles. Brooks scientists at the School of Aerospace Medicine were tasked with conducting research to determine the new radar's emission levels. Their findings, supported by the Environmental Protection Agency, concluded that the new Air Force radar systems posed no hazard to human health. As a residual benefit from the Brooks studies, important new data were developed for high-frequency radiation absorption that led to the first frequency-dependent radio-frequency radiation exposure standards in the U.S. Radiation absorption levels were also the focus of related research at Brooks involving a discovery that ultimately benefited public health and safety. Doctors Jonathan Keel and Dave Irwin pioneers in electromagnetic radiation countermeasures, contributed to the invention of a chemical compound that possessed radiation absorption qualities. This polymer mimicked the photosynthetic process that plants use to convert sunlight into chemical energy. The process that creates this compound, called DOM, results in the release of energy as light. Electrical and magnetic fields can manipulate the speed of the compound's chemical light. The compound was originally developed to measure and map microwave radiation absorption levels in people. That same molecule now is used to target biological agents with microwaves. Because if you attach a, to a biological agent, you can actually destroy it much easier with microwaves. It was subsequently adapted for another purpose when Brooks scientists discovered that DALM's slow luminescence could be made by bacteria. Certain bacteria and other cells can create this chemical within themselves, something animals and human cells cannot do. The Brooks research team engineered these organisms to respond to specific toxins by finding and tagging them with the light-emitting chemical. This luminescent chemical, a sort of microwave-activated antibiotic, kills the toxin. Air Force research had produced a substance that used microwave radiation to eradicate potential bioweapons. Another Brooks Air Force Base asset that contributed to helping assess and mitigate the effects of radiation is the Air Force Radiation Assessment Team, nicknamed AFRAT. Established in 1981, AFRAT is capable of responding worldwide to assess levels of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation accidents. The team also provides on-site health physics consultation and instrumentation for detecting, identifying, and quantifying any type of radiation hazard. AFRAD is part of the Defense Department's Nuclear Emergency Response Team. They're ready to go every day, 365 days a year, and that's the AFRAT team, Air Force Radiation Assessment Team, uh, and, and their role is to, uh, their responsibility is to respond to a dirty bomb or a nuclear accident or a nuclear incident uh, anywhere around the world. 
AFRAT was called to action in April 1986 following the Chernobyl nuclear accident in the Ukraine. Within 24 hours of the accident, Brooks scientists assessed and analyzed airborne radiation levels produced in the atmospheric plume from debris expelled by the Chernobyl reactor. During a 12-day study, Air Force scientists collected air, water, and soil samples from the affected area for analysis at Brooks. Non-ionizing radiation from lasers and other directed energy emitters has also been the focus of Air Force research. For nearly 30 years, Brooks Air Force Base was the Air Force Center for Non-Ionizing Radiation Hazards Research. The base assumed this role as a consequence of laser technology development. There was an emerging laser technology that was developed in the late 80s called ultra-short lasers. And those are lasers that put out pulses that are very, very short in duration. So they're millions of billions of seconds in duration. And that technology was uh, beginning to be developed into uh, technologies that might actually find their way into Air Force systems. And so the question was, are we ready for them, uh, for a human to be interacting with the possibility of those lasers being in the battlefield? Since 1993, the Tri-Service Project Reliance Team pooled the scientific resources of the Army, Navy, and Air Force at Brooks in a collaborative research partnership. They primarily worked on determining the biological hazards of lasers to characterize the effects of non-ionizing radiation emitted by military systems. Personnel susceptibility to laser effects. We were worried that lasers would cause damage to eyes for our pilots. Brooks directed energy researchers focused on laser ocular effects. The eyes are brain tissue which does not regenerate. Brooks scientists helped pioneer the development of laser eye protection. Well, laser eye protection is important. We have systems of our own which are uh, potentially damaging to eyes at large distances, designators and range finders, and then we're worried about emanating threats also, so the balance here is to get something that's better than what you use in the laboratory so that you will be able to see your instruments when you're flying and be able to do your mission, do the military operations uh, without degrading vision too much and not being susceptible to damage from a laser hitting your eye. The impetus for the Air Force's interest in laser eye protection for air crews was a dramatic increase in the commercial and individual use of lasers. This included laser light shows and handheld laser devices such as laser pointers. These lasers posed a threat to military and commercial aviation. In the last three or four years, there have been hundreds of incidents every year of uh, people from the ground illuminating pilots in the, in the United States with lasers uh, as they're flying around with lasers that are handheld that are getting more powerful and are a potential threat to people flying and pilots are very worried about that. The Air Force worked with industry to commercially develop laser eye protection devices. In the development of laser eye protection, this, it progressed to a, uh, a this is a block zero field in about 2000, and uh, a follow on to that to provide protection for some visible wavelengths and now this is a more recent one, more of a wrap design, doesn't let lasers in the sides as much and uh, protects against some visible and some near-infrared wavelengths. The Air Force also collaborated with industry to provide laser intrusion training devices. This initiative ultimately led to collaboration with the Federal Aviation Administration for commercial airline pilot laser illumination simulation training. This is a demonstrator which we use to show pilots in air crew uh, the effects of laser eye protection. There are some uh, 
threat wavelengths in the background here, red and a red one and a green one. And when you put on your laser eye protection, you can see how the threat wavelengths would be blocked out, yet your green cockpit wavelengths would still be visible. Besides contributing to public safety with laser simulation training for commercial and general aviation pilots, Air Force Directed Energy Research at Brooks also produced safety standards for laser and radio frequency radiation exposure. These standards have been accepted worldwide in government, industry, and medicine. I see the research that we do here transitioned into documents that help protect uh, everyone who uses a laser in the world. Brooks' research also has involved solving mysteries associated with fallen warriors who paid the ultimate price for America's freedom. Since its inception in 1983, the Life Sciences Equipment Laboratory has played a pivotal role in accounting for Americans missing in action. The lab initially was created by founding director Michael Grost to support military aircraft accident investigations through life support equipment analysis. The lab earned a reputation for successfully supporting worst case scenario mishap investigations. In 1988, the lab's mission expanded to support an important and ongoing Defense Department initiative. We support the Joint POW-MIA Accounting Command that's located at Hickam Air Force Base, and they are tasked essentially to uh, go out into the field and investigate and recover any Americans that are essentially classified as missing in action. So they have a large tasking, if you will, to uh, find these folks. Now, one of the biggest problems that we have, especially in the Vietnam time period, with the acidic soils and also the environmental conditions that are uh, confronted with the teams, is that we're finding very little in human remains. Uh, right now, by law, there's two Two ways that you can account for an individual. Either the individual comes out of the jungle and we now know what has happened to him, so now he's home, or you have essentially the human remains that have been recovered and you either do in dentition studies looking at dental work or you do mitochondrial DNA where we're able to do a sequencing and then get an, an answer there and we can identify the individual. The U.S. Army Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii is tasked with forensic analysis of human remains. The Life Sciences Equipment Lab augments the Hawaii Lab's work through artifact analysis of crash sites where human remains have not been found. Together with the Central Identification Lab, full accounting has been achieved in cases that include missing Americans from World War II, the Cold War, and the Korean and Vietnam Wars. We essentially work on what they call the third method of accounting, and that is looking at the equipment remnants of clothing and life support equipment, parachutes, ejection seats, things of that nature, that are durable enough to go withstand, say, an aircraft uh, impacting the ground, say, with individuals on board. And from those equipment remnants, we were able to make the determination of how many people are there, if we have any duplications, such as two right boots looking for two different crew members, or we can uh, determine not only the equipment type, whether it's a spe uh, service specific, if you will, whether I'm looking at an Army case or an Air Force or Navy, we all use very different equipment. And we can also uh, make the determination on whether the incident was survivable. Artifacts help investigators reconstruct the pattern and type of their host structure. Along with damage assessment, artifacts provide an overall image of what the evidence supported about its previous user's fate. Brooks investigators translated all equipment and test results into a determination about the accountability of missing personnel. Their actions have provided closure to many families of MIAs. The Brooks Lab's analyses changed the dynamics where the presence of human remains no longer held the key to MIA accountability. The collective vision, energy, and dedication of the Brooks scientific community primarily supported America's warfighters, but ultimately existed to serve man. The final chapter in the story of Brooks began with the transformation of the base into a unique entity within the Department of Defense. Air Force Secretary F. Witten Peters, acting on the authority of the Military Construction Appropriations Act, authorized the establishment of the base efficiency project at Brooks. The project transformed the Air Force base into Brooks City Base for the purpose of improving mission effectiveness and reducing the cost of providing quality installation support. The military installation was conveyed to the city of San Antonio on July 22, 2002 in a special ceremony. The public event was held at Hangar 9, 
the last of the 12 wooden aircraft hangars that were built in 1917 when Brooksfield became a primary flying training base during World War I. The Brooks Development Authority, a political subdivision of the state of Texas, was created by the city of San Antonio to be the property managers of the former Air Force base. The Brooks Development Authority and Air Force entered into a purchase and sale agreement. The Air Force agreed to sell real property to the Brooks Development Authority and lease back facilities it needed to continue supporting various Air Force missions. An act of Congress had to create this project of city base. The state legislature of Texas had to also create an accepting uh, piece of legislation that would allow the property to transfer to the city of San Antonio, which created the Brooks Development Authority and allowed us to be the property owners in exchange for the lease back uh, rent that our Air Force friends pay us.